As we continue to look at the account of the wayward son from Luke chapter 11, today we're going to look at this from the perspective of the father. I guess I was typecast as the old guy. Well, maybe that's a good thing. Having raised three children, all of whom are now married, living on their own, having their own families, and seem to be doing quite well, perhaps I maybe look at this just a little bit differently than some other people. Now, I suspect that either during last week's lesson or sometime in preparation for it, you might have read the passage out of Luke chapter 15 of the prodigal son. So I'm not going to take time to read it again, but open your Bibles to Luke 15. We might need to refer to it a little bit later on as we go on. You know, we chose to do this recording out here in my front yard, and I'm looking out down my driveway and out to the road in front of my house because we know that the father in the parable of the prodigal son spent a good bit of time doing just that thing. And we'll talk more about that in just a little bit later. And as I go through this, I may from time to time uh, create, uh, treat this more like a uh, just a, a real family instead of the parable that we know that it is. And I'm not discounting the fact that it's a parable, but there's some lessons there that we might learn for our real uh, families today. You know, years ago, I heard a saying that really summed up the role of the father and the mother, both parents, when it comes to raising children. And the saying went like this, the role of the parents is to give their children roots and wings. Now, the speaker went on to say, roots are usually not the problem. The implication is that giving our children wings is really the more difficult task. For example, I remember years ago when our oldest daughter, who's now in her 40s, was first driving on her own the first time she drove after she had gotten her driver's license. And as she left, I noticed that Susan was sitting at the dining room table. Now at our house there, the dining room table looked out over the end of our driveway and you could see the road that went by our house. And Susan was just sitting there staring out that window. And one thing I knew was that the best thing for me to do was to say nothing. Because our oldest child, our first child, had just taken a giant leap in their wings as they were beginning the trek, leaving home. And, you know, I don't know. You know, maybe old dad was watching his son as he rode and walked away, as well as looking for him when he came back that we know about. But since, you know, this scripture is so great, we can slice it and dice it in so many different ways. I'd like to think about this maybe as from a real family first. You know, we often think that this younger son must have been really greedy or rebellious or something, you know, I have no doubt that there might not have been an element of that, but the fact remains is the father was willing to let him go. You know, the father was willing to let him go out and be his own man. The father was ready to say, okay, son, it's time for you to try things on your own. He was willing to give his son a chance one of the great roles of parents. Now, he didn't know that his son was going to make a long series of very bad choices, but I think maybe he had great expectations of what his son might do out in the world. Because I'll tell you, as a parent, we parents have great expectations of our children. Now, this is a parable again, and I don't want to lose track of that. But the fact remains is that I think the father, a real father anyway, was hoping that his son had learned the lessons that he had taught him over the years very well. Now, we know that the family business, probably in agriculture, 
was doing quite well. There were cattle or sheep or livestock or something. Uh, there were uh, servants, so they were big enough to have some hired servants. And so that probably presumes that there was some great amount of wealth around and around as well. And through the years, no doubt the father had poured into both of his sons a great deal of time teaching them, uh, showing them the business, knowing what to, showing them what to do right, and had just prepared them by increasingly giving them more difficult and more responsibility in the family business. But now it was time to see if all those lessons had stuck. You know, the thing that I would like for everybody, young and old alike, who might view this video, to get is that to look at successful people and model ourselves after them and follow those lessons that we can learn from people who are successful and not discard them as just old fashioned or, you know, oh, I, that, my dad did that, so I can't do it. And then, as we see more about the love of the father for his son, you know, I, it was pretty obvious that the choices this younger son made were not those that really dad approved of. But the incredible thing is, his love could look past that was still his son, his son whom he had trained from youth. You know, people of all ages, and I'm certainly not down on teens as this, for this, because it happens to people of all ages, but we have a very dangerous tendency to cast aside and forget forever people who either have done maybe something wrong to us, or perhaps, you know, they do something that we dislike or we think they're just too different. You know, over the many years of working with teens and college students, I have seen so many people that have fenced themselves in by holding grudges and by making judgments that are not warranted at all. Now, the father could have, when his son returned, said, you blew it, and leave it there. But that wasn't it. He let that, he looked past that. He saw that the son had learned a lesson, maybe not all the lessons that dad had taught over the years, but he had certainly learned a lesson. And you know, Jason reminded us in last week's video about how going home sometimes can be hard. And yes, sometimes it's hard if you've had a disagreement with somebody, or maybe you've been in the wrong, or somebody has wronged you. It's hard to go meet with that person. It's hard to start the conversation about getting this all behind us. You know, Christians need to be in the forefront of acceptance and forgiveness. And yes, going home can be hard. Are we welcome anymore? Will I be accepted after what I've done? The love of the father of the prodigal son was a dramatic answer yes to both of those. And now let's spend a few minutes and we'll look at the real meaning of this parable that Jesus intended to teach. Jesus was trying to explain to them the unexplainable. He is trying to put in terms that people can understand the enormity of the unfailing love that God has for us. You know, a few years ago, a song came on the worship music scene. It's a song called Reckless Love by Corey Asbury. Now, the first time I heard this song, I thought, hmm, what message is he trying to tell us here? So I went home and I 
pulled up the lyrics and I printed them out and I studied them for a while. And after a while I decided I knew the message and it was being presented very well. And the message was God's love is unimaginable to us, incomprehensible to us. It is that deep and wide and wider that we can see. For example, the chorus of the song goes like this. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you gave yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God overwhelming, incomprehensible, never ending for sure. Now, just as a quick aside, that leaving the 99 is a reference to another parable that is just a few verses ahead of the prodigal son parable in Luke chapter 15. It's the story of the lost sheep. And by the way, there's a third parable right there with it called the lost coin. The three parables all about lostness a really interesting thing to study as a set as we see different aspects of how God's love chases after us as we go forward. Now, this is exactly the type of love that was outlined in this song that was demonstrated by the father of the prodigal son. His desire was to see his son safe, back into the house, household, and until that happened, it occupied his mind every single day, endlessly watching down the driveway, endlessly looking and hoping. Now, when his son did appear, that love demonstrated itself in still a different way. The, the Bible tells us that he went and he ran to meet his son. Now, in that society, a successful adult running down the road was just something you didn't do. It was something that was not done in the society where, out where people could see us. How undignified it was. How childish could he be? But you know, to the prodigal son's father, none of that made any difference. Everything was secondary to the joy that he was feeling as he could again embrace his son. You know, that kind of explains what God's love is like for us every day today. You know, the song goes on to say this. It says, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall that you won't kick down or lie that you will tear down, coming after me. What the song is saying is, we simply cannot fully, completely grasp the enormity of the love of God. Is it reckless? Is that the right word to use? Well, let's think about reckless for just a minute. Now, whether something is reckless or not depends entirely upon the skills and the abilities of the person doing the act, whatever it might be. For example, for me to go rock climbing or drive a race car in the Indianapolis 500, that would be reckless. But yet to others, it's a very commonplace thing, something that they can do with great, great ability. My abilities don't account for that. Other people's do. So when we think about the love of God and we think about what it might be, would it be reckless? By human standards, maybe to give up his son, to sacrifice his son on our behalf. But to God, that's normal. That's just what he does. 
Will we ever fully, completely understand it? Not this side of heaven, but it's there for us every day. You know, the parable ends with a joyous homecoming and festival. And, you know, this idea of a homecoming and home, being at home, home is a place of safety, of security. You know, for a lot of you, I suspect that 2020 might be in this parable compared to the time that the lost son was out feeding pigs, to which we would sum up with anything but that. And that's maybe how <laughs> we describe 2020. But important thing to keep in mind is God is always calling us home to him. Now, I'm not just talking about when you die and go to be, be with the Lord forever, which is a sure promise of all those who follow Jesus. I'm talking about right now. He's calling us home today, home to him, home to where we are close to those who we love. Home is where we have peace and we have rest. Home is where we're accepted. When life seems to be crashing down all around us, there's no better time to draw on the comfort and security that is found in the love of God in a way that only He can provide it. Whatever short-term circumstances may be, you can be home with God. Remember the song said, I didn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you gave yourself away. Wow, what a thought. What a wonderful thought. You know, in closing, I'd say this. Psalm 46.1 reminds us that God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Remember, as the son turned and returned to the father who greeted him warmly, in the same way, Today, if we turn to God, He will gladly and enthusiastically come and welcome us.